so uh, we, we, we celebrate today, we pay homage to, to three architects. And I begin with uh, Peter Parler, uh, who was uh, uh, unknown to me until a few days ago. And I'm happy uh, I, I, uh, I learned a little bit about him. This is a short presentation, but I hope it will incite interest about this uh, uh, so-called craftsman and sculptor and architect. And he apparently was, was very, very uh, uh, well known at that time. And, uh, and uh, the family he was part of was equally um, uh, a famous uh, um, family in the field of, uh, of building. So Peter Parler, uh, 1333, he was born on, on, on July 13th and he died in 1399, so the 14th century. So Peter Parler, um, uh, you see several names in German, in Czech, because he uh, worked a lot in Prague and in, um, I don't know where, what is Swabia, I, I guess Sweden, who uh, was a German bohemian architect and sculptor from the Parler family of master builders. Along with his father, Heinrich Parler, he's one of the most prominent and influential craftsmen of the Middle Ages, born and apprenticed in the town of, <laughs> I hesitate to pronounce, sorry, Peter worked at several important late medieval building sites, including Strasbourg, Cologne, and Nuremberg. Very important cathedrals are in Strasbourg, Köln, and Nuremberg. After 1356, he lived in Prague, capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia and seat of the Holy Roman Empire, where he created his most famous works, St. Vitus Cathedral and the, uh, and the, and the Charles uh, Bridge. So uh, now you'll see a self-portrait in stone from around 1370. Uh, this was the man. And you know that in the Middle Ages, uh, we have very rarely uh, names of those great builders who built those great cathedrals. So um, this is a rare uh, occasion to actually know the name of, uh, of one of the builders. Um, and sometimes I wonder why uh, that, that uh, sublime uh, anonymity is so uh, absent uh, these days. We sign everything and we think that we are the authors of everything, when in fact it's not quite so. I kept saying that I saw a drawing, a little sketch by Tadao Ando at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where there was a retrospective of Tadao Ando, and he made a sketch like, uh, I don't know, 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters on a huge wall, at least 10 meters long, and he signed that sketch in, in, on, on both the left bottom corner and the right bottom corner twice. He signed the wall. I mean, everybody knew it was the Tadawando exhibition and uh, that wall certainly could not have disappeared. Why he signed it twice is beyond me. And here we have a great builder and uh, his, uh, you know, as I said, a rare occasion that we know his name but nobody knows the names of the builders of Chartres Cathedral, or Amiens Cathedral, or Rouen Cathedral, or Reims Cathedral. And they were great buildings. So I compare my age with that age. You know, we sign everything, you know, even the most insignificant sketch, while they didn't sign cathedrals. And indeed, how could you sign a cathedral? Anyway. This is in Münster, uh, in, in, in Germany. He just did uh, this, this part of the building. Um, but you already feel uh, that there is skill here. And uh, it moves me that, that this is from the 14th century. It's, you know, more than 600 years old. Uh, this is uh, in Nuremberg, uh, where the first, well, Strangely, this I took from Wikipedia, and they say that where the first sculpture by Peter Parler can be directly identified, but they don't show the sculpture. They just show the, the, the Frauenkirche in Nuremberg, a great, a great church as far as I can, I can see. Uh, and yes, again, they move me, these buildings, you know, they, they, they are old and they have dignity and they have beauty. 
and they were built almost anonymously. Uh, now the interior of St. Vito's Cathedral uh, clearly showing the parlor style balustrade. Now these comments from Wikipedia, which I took uh, pressed by time are a little bit um, infantile, but uh, the cathedral is not. And this is a very important cathedral in Prague. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, he worked, I mean, he, he, he built the whole, the whole cathedral actually. And this is one of the most important buildings in Prague, which has great buildings. And uh, you will also see the Charles Bridge built by, um, by this um, craftsman architect. Um, anyway, apparently he, he was very innovative in the field, the way he, he created these, uh, these uh, arches here, these, these nerves of the ceiling, of the roofing. And um, I, I myself, I'm not, I'm far from being very, very, very knowledgeable about him, but it is a, an invitation both towards you and me to study further, because I think the Middle Ages are still unknown. We value everything from the Renaissance onwards, but in terms of the Middle Ages, we are rather ignorant. Uh, most of us and most histories of, uh, of architecture somehow uh give the impression that the great achievement started in the renaissance or in the antique world but the gothic times were were marvelous in the field of architecture so i guess this is the balustrade now i don't know or or here i, I am I'm a little bit confused what that comment uh, meant well, he built the whole building, so it's, I don't know why that comment about the, the, the balustrade. Now, the Charles Bridge and the old town, um, uh, he also, I guess, built several buildings in the old town of Prague. Uh, this is, he built the, the old town bridge tower um, that, that is uh, adjacent to the bridge. And this is the bridge. And it is indeed a great, a great stone, uh, stone bridge. And when you think about it, that is more than 600 years old. Uh, it's impossible not to be moved by it. So the, the man who built it was born today on July 13th, 1333. Uh, that's a long time ago, six, let me see if I can count, 688 uh, 80 years old, almost, almost 700 years ago. People still walking on this bridge, but uh, you can tell <laughs> this bridge is difficult to, to, to dismantle. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite massive. Prague is indeed a very rich uh, city in, in, in the field of architecture. He also built this tower. And I like this darkened stone, you know, whatever uh, uh, Le Corbusier said at uh, Con le Cathedrale, at Le Blanche, when, when the cathedrals were white, I personally don't think the cathedrals were ever white because stone is not actually white. So the obsession with whiteness, which Le Corbusier did have at, at a certain time in his life, is a little bit uh, dubious to me. The stone is rather grayish. I mean, there are some white stones, but uh, uh, no, the, I don't think the cathedrals were ever white. I, I, I would rather think that Monsieur Le Corbusier was a little bit uh, uh, reluctant to be in touch with his own psychological darkness or with his own um, Jungian uh, shadow, so to speak. Anyway, uh, I also I think Notre Dame de Paris, the cathedral in Paris was, 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 uh, was diminished in a way aesthetically by being too cleaned up, you know, the facade, the Western facade uh, of uh, Notre Dame is, um, you know, suspiciously white. I mean, it is, uh, unconvincingly whitish or cleaned up. Now, I think, I think the stone has to show the passage of time. And, and here it does show the passage of time. 
and I'm glad the, the, the Czechs didn't uh, clean it up to please uh, the tourists or uh, Monsieur Le Corbusier. This is not a little thing, you know, more than 650 years ago, this, this, this were built and they still stand. Thank God that they, they escaped uh, the ravages of the Second World War. Now the tomb of Peter Parler in the cathedral Obviously, he was not anybody uh, if he was, uh, you know, uh, this is his tomb inside this most important cathedral in Prague. How many architects today find their Domus Eterna in a church or in a cathedral? I don't know of any, actually. And in a way, maybe they don't deserve it. I don't know. No, I mean, no, I'm, I shouldn't say this, but it's true. We, we don't build the cathedrals any longer, really. And I mean, we, some are being built, but uh, in this way, no, we don't. And uh, anyway, here, this is a castle uh, that, that he worked on. But even this is impressive, you know, uh, and I, I, I'm more and more and, uh, incited and stirred up to, to study further the work of this um, uh, so-called uh, craftsman. Now the south portal of St. Vitus Cathedral. And look at this. He even worked on, 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 on Stephen Dome on, on the St. Stephen Cathedral in Vienna. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, which was uh, ravished by, uh, by uh, time and by war. This is stonework, you know, let us not uh, ignore this fact. This is done in stone. And, uh, you know, <laughs> easy for us to, to claim uh, superiority in the field of, I, I don't know what, but when you think that the right embroidery is here in stone, nothing else but, but, but stone, and there are embroideries. I mean, look here, look at this window. And who said that the Middle Ages didn't have unbelievable uh, craft and knowledge? They did, but it was a collective art. And I think Kumaraswamy, the great Indian uh, scholar who also taught in, in, in Boston, when he said that between the craft the, the, the art of building of the Middle Ages in Europe and uh, the, 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 the art of building in Asia, uh, in India, uh, where incredible temples were erected collectively, there is a similarity. It was the last time when Europe built collectively uh, in, a, in a significant way, just as it happened in, in Asia. And once the Renaissance arrived, this happened increasingly less. Uh, and, and now it's, it is inconceivable that we erect buildings of this magnitude because of a collective effort and an anonymous effort. But this was supposed to be the house of God. So, um, you know, again, a pathetic little human uh, signature would be totally uh, inappropriate actually, you know, uh, in, in the case of building the house of God, which the cathedral was supposed to be. There is beauty here, no one can contest it. I wonder what these builders felt when they erected and you know, I'm sure most of them died, he, even he died before the cathedral was completed. Um, At a different time, and maybe I idealized that time, but I, I, I kind of miss that, that chance to build for something that mattered. And for them, it mattered. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we have other, you know, uh, 
interests and some some of them are noble you know like building social housing and building guild kindergartens and so on but um, we simplified a lot in an almost tragic way uh, the 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 task of the architect I mean, how many architects today talk about the, the infinite or about God, you know, they, most of them don't even believe any longer, you know, in, in England, two churches uh, a year are desacralized. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, there are people who, 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 who live inside the church, they have apartments, you know, studios and so on inside the church. There is a circus company which, uh, you know, bought or rented a church in England and so on. Anyway, the, the treasury, the open parlor style, because he uh, and his father generated this so-called parlor style. And you can see it at St. Vitus Cathedral. It's very fine. I mean, and, and also rather unconventional, this, this, this portion of the structure, the ribs of the, of the roof. Are, are, are remarkable and again they are done with stone they were they were highly knowledgeable these people you know they were not just craftsmen because i think um, through the perspective of walter gropius they were exalted craftsmen that is they were artists they deserved the word the name artist because yes, they had the knowledge and they knew a craft, but they were also their souls were exalted without ex some form of exaltation. You cannot build in this way. The old town in uh, hall in Prague also done by him. Uh, I'm envious of, of Prague because, you know, it has a, a town hall from, from the 14th century. This man at that time, well, he was the most important architect in Prague. And Prague was a very important city. It's still a very important city, but at that time it was... Uh, was uh, indeed very important i wonder how many people who pass by know the name of the architect well maybe they know because he was uh, in prague uh, personality but uh, you know the tourists come and go they take pictures but they don't know that, that there were uh, the equivalent of the best architects of today who built this in the 14th century. This is a sculpture by him, Madonna and Child, 1375-1380, which is in Warsaw. And uh, again, it moves me that an architect and the craftsman at that time, a builder also was a sculptor, was an artist. And, uh, you know, if I compare being an architect today with being an architect then, of course, they, there were difficulties then, the people lived less, there were problems, uh, like all of us, it uh, doesn't matter the time we live in. But I envy this involvement of the artist. You know, how, how many architects today are acknowledged sculptors? And how many of us are, are asked to, 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 to employ our uh, artistic abilities in the exercise, not just of, of, of architecture, but also of art? Very few, if at all. And it's sad, it's this degradation of architecture in the name of reason, in the name of enlightenment, and, and something was broken down. And I think we have to make the efforts to reestablish the architect as a cultural and artistic figure is very, very important, not just for the architect himself or herself, but for the life of the city, of the place, of a country. Of, it's important. I don't know if we can still do it. Uh, 
yes, here the ravages of time uh, are shown, and yet even even in a mutilated uh, body of Christ, uh, uh, you can see beauty and spirit. Look at this hand. Look at these fingers done in stone again. So his legacy, <clears throat> Peter Parler was one of the most well-known and influential craftsmen of the Middle Ages. The designs of both him and his father became known as the Parler style and spread throughout Central Europe. Significant examples include St. Martin's Church, Landshut, uh, we began in 1839, so uh, uh, 10 years before he died. St. Lawrence, Nuremberg, uh, the nave began in 1400. Well, he was already de dead, but maybe some plans or, you know, the conception of, 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 of that work began with him. St. George uh, Minster, uh, well, I guess I guess these examples show also the, the influence that the, the Parler family had. St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, the, the South Tower began in 1368, we, when he was still, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very active. He died in 1399. And numerous other examples across the Hanseatic League, League from the Netherlands to Poland. Examples can also be found in Scandinavia, such as at St. Mary's in Helsinger in Denmark. Okay, so uh, he died on this day, July 13th, and 1399. Okay, now we go to the second architect we try to pay homage to today, and that is a very important uh, Victorian uh, architect, uh, Sir George. Gilbert Scott, the one who William Morris hated, but uh, you know, it's not uncommon to have uh, important uh, architects and artists hate each other. Anyway, Sir George Gilbert Scott, born in 1811 and died in 1878, so he died at 67. Uh, Sir Gil George Gilbert Scott, known as Sir Gilbert Scott, was a prolific English Gothic revival architect, chiefly associated with the design, building and renovation of churches and cathedrals, although he started his career as a leading designer of workhouses. Over 800 buildings were designed or altered by him. Well, this is not a little thing. I mean, uh, I wonder what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright would have said. Frank Lloyd Wright built about uh, 500 and designed over 1,000. These men, I don't know how many uh, of those 800 were built, but, but he was without doubt a workforce himself. Scott was the architect of many iconic buildings, including the Midland Grand Hotel at St. Pacra Station, the Albert Memorial, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, all in London. St. Mary's Cathedral, Glasgow, the main building of the University of Glasgow, St. Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh, and King's College Chapel in London. Now, William Morris obviously hated him. He called him the happily dead dog when he died, uh, poor uh, George Gilbert um, Scott. But Sir George Gilbert Scott uh, this, this person, a uh, critic, Simon Jenkins, uh, uh, wrote that he was the unsung hero of British architecture. So there, you know, you have the, the, the perception of William Morris, and then you have the perception of this um, uh, critic, uh, totally uh, opposite to each other. This was the man. He does look like a, a man of will, a man, uh, you know, of, of great determination. 
Sir George Gilbert Scott. There are several Scots in uh, in uh, in uh, in the pantheon of uh, Victorian architecture. Sometimes I get confused myself, but uh, <laughs> through repetition, I hope uh, the, the truth will consolidate itself. Sir George Gilbert Scott. Now, in the case of the previous architect, we only had a self-portrait in stone. There were no engravings, no drawings, no photographs. So, Sir George Gilbert Scott, as you can see, born July 13th, uh, styled Sir Gilbert Scott was a prolific English Gothic revival architect, chiefly associated with the design building a renovation of churches. I think I already read this. I don't know why this is here. I'm sorry. Uh, this one also I read. Uh, Midland Grand Hotel in London. Now just look at this interior, you know, I mean, uh, yes, it is a Gothic revival. Yes, it is a revival. And yes, Frank Lloyd Wright would have protested. That is not truly original, but uh, I wouldn't be so drastic. No one can contest, you know, the richness of this interior and uh, even the, the drama. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the neo-Gothic has some virtues beyond being just a revival. But it's a hotel, yes. Uh, it's not a church, it's a hotel. It's a modern, uh, it has a modern function but uh, um, the, the architecture is, is indeed very, very rich. Uh, this is a drawing, it shouldn't be here, I'm sorry. So this is how the hotel looks like from the outside. The Victorian age was, was quite, uh, quite amazing uh, and very, very rich. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think uh, uh, yes, the architecture of the of, uh, during the time of Queen Victoria is uh, is very worthy of being uh, contemplated. I mean, they built so many churches. Just uh, Pugin, well, Pugin lived a little bit. Uh, you know, Queen Victoria mainly is uh, about the second half of the nineteenth century, but. They had at least 10, 15 architects who built tens and tens of churches and cathedrals and so on. You know, this is a secular building, but when you look at it, it's you know, somehow it transcends the prose of what we call secular. Now, let's look at the building on the left and let's look at the buildings on the right and let's look at the building in the middle, which is the hotel by uh, Sir Gilbert uh, Scott. Well, which one is richer? I think this one is richer. And I, I don't have really passeist inclinations, but, uh, and, and I love modernity. But what is the great uh, progress when I look at this and when I look at this compared to this. I mean, this building is still the pride of the city. No question. Uh, it seems the, the happily dead dog, as William Morris called uh, poor uh, George uh, Gilbert Scott, uh, did a good job, actually. Now, the Albert Memorial in Hyde Park in London is also his work.
these are important works in the in the urban fabric of this great city which london is He didn't do the sculpture, but uh, it doesn't matter. The sculpture is integrated into the whole work. And so he, he was the coordinator of it all. So yes, there is a difference between the, the Gothic of uh, Peter Parler and the Gothic, the neo-Gothic of uh, Sir Gilbert uh, Scott. There is a difference. Of course, uh, 500 uh, years passed um, since uh, Peter Parler and, and, and him. But the, the nostalgia for, uh, for, uh, for the Gothic uh, persists, it seems. we eliminated ornament from architecture. By eliminating ornament from architecture, we protested against uh, the excesses of late 19th century. I understood this at the beginning of the 20th century. But now we are 100 years later and the ornament is coming back with great force. And we need the ornament because the ornament can bring some sensitivity to a structure which otherwise could uh, could uh, become uh, obsessive and uh, dry and uh, and uh, not very uplifting so i think we do need we do need the ornament to come back the foreign and commonwealth office in london now this is a whitish uh, you know uh, governmental building there are many like this built by various architects in london the interior, though, is different, and I'm happy it is. It's not white. The interior is, uh, uh, as you can see, rich, ornamental, uh, colorful. And even the most uh, rebellious and mod so-called modern architects cannot contest that there is a richness here. And this richness is not... Uh, you know, uh, really the, the greatest evil on earth, I think. And the celestial references, we, which we also saw in the hotel that he built, you know, with the bluish uh, uh, ceiling, uh, clear, uh, you know, uh, reference to, to the blue of the sky. Uh, it, it's maybe naive from our point of view, but uh, uh, that, that bluishness goes well with the goldness. And you can see, you know, the stars are gold. And, uh, and so there is a dialectic there that is connecting us, connects the earth with the sky. 
And, and again, again, we don't think about such matters any longer. We are too emancipated to allow ourselves such naivetes, you know, such uh, we, are, we are too mature, so to speak. But what, what does our maturity mean, you know, really? Wow, wow, what does it mean? Ah, by the way, uh, Peter Parler, apparently his name was given to a, uh, an asteroid, uh, to, a, to a celestial uh, body. I forgot exactly. I should have taken down that information. But yes, there is some kind of a celestial body named uh, Peter Parler. Maybe in the future we'll have one named, I don't know, uh, Zaha Hadid or Frank Gehry or whatever. St. Mary's Cathedral, Glasgow. Look at this. It is indeed a cathedral. Um, even in black and white, the picture shows clearly a cathedral. He probably built uh, close to 100. I mean, th those Victorian architects built so many churches and cathedrals. Cathedrals is unbelievable. Again, the blue sky. Edinburgh. So the, the previous one was in Glasgow. This one is in Edinburgh. Uh, they, they are very impressive, these uh, neo-Gothic uh, cathedrals. In fact, in Paris, I lived for a short while in Paris. I liked more a 19th century cathedral that I lived nearby than uh, the cleaned up uh, Notre Dame de Paris. I, I have to say it. I liked more the, the darker cathedral from the 19th century, not far away from uh, L'Assemblée Nationale. This is also an interesting building uh, by uh, Sir Gilbert Scott, George Gilbert Scott. Edinburgh. They have a great uh, theatre festival in Edinburgh and there is also a great uh, theatre festival in Avignon in the south of France. And on the third place is a great, now I'm becoming patriotic, a great uh, theatre festival in Sibiu. Some people say that uh, the best in the world is the one from Sibiu and the most skeptical ones they say is in the third place after Edinburgh and Avignon, but still it is uh, incredible that this happened in just, uh, you know, 10, 15 years. Which shows, and I'm talking to the Romanians here, it shows that it is possible to do wonders and uh, it is possible when you have a great passion for doing something. Uh, you know, uh, I remember when I came to, from the United States to visit my parents and um, I knew that the theater in Sibiu was totally dead, but I saw a poster with the idiot by Dostoevsky of a play and because I love Dostoevsky, I said, let me go to the theater. And I did go uh, without any expectations. And there were just two or three people in the, in the, in the theater, but I was dwarfed uh, me coming from New York by the quality uh, and the avant-garde spirit of the play. And when I exited, I, I realized, I said to myself, something is happening here in Sibiu. This was in 1990 something. The fact that such a play so innovative, so creative, so abstract, so beautiful was happening in a city known for having a dead theater I said to myself, something is happening, and it did happen. And now 
after Edinburgh, which has a great tradition, and uh, Avignon, which has a great tradition, this little town in Transylvania has the third most important international uh, theatre festival in the world. And, and at this very moment, theatre is represented by the theatre in Sibiu, in Tokyo, at the Olympics that will start soon, if they didn't already. Yes, the, uh, the, the theatre in Sibiu was chosen to represent, uh, to, to play uh, during the Olympics in Tokyo. You see, it is possible to do wonderful things if you have passion and if you work hard. Anyway, back to Edinburgh and its cathedral built by Sir Gilbert, George Gilbert Scott. Darkened by time, but it's nice that it is darkened by time. And what I like about these cathedrals, even if there is a scaffolding uh, attached to the building, the building still looks great because process somehow is part of the, of the um, uh, is, is an intrinsic part of the reality of a building. It's a building which continuously needs some adjustments or refurbishments or I, I don't know, it, it's alive. It, it, it's, it, it's just like a, a human body, like an organism. It's in the process of becoming, it's not just being. It is a great cathedral. And it was built by the happily do uh, dead dog. <laughs> I, I admire William Morris, but I don't know why he called. Uh, I should learn about this more. Anyway, University of Glasgow. And look at this. Be, 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 be prepared to be surprised. It's, it's, uh, it has, in my opinion, that the spire is too tall. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe this was the fashion at that time. Uh, I personally would have done the spire a little bit more modest, but uh, it wasn't me who was asked to design it. But still, stone has its prestige, and stone ages, uh, ages well. Now he plays such a spire on a hotel, on a cathedral, and uh, on a university. I guess it was a sign of uh, uh, psychological verticality, or I don't know how to call it. <clears throat> there is opulence here, no doubt. I mean, what university in the present would afford just this carpet, you know, designed specifically because you can tell it's a. Uh, it's coordinated in terms of colors and, and pattern with the walls and everything. It's a citadel of learning, that's what it is. King's College Chapel in London. I mean, these are, I only show some of his works. Certainly, I, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot show 800 buildings. We still have to uh, review, so to speak, the very rich activity of Otto Wagner, the, the giant of uh, Austrian architecture. But it's kind of interesting to go from 14th century Prague, you know, to 19th century uh, Great Britain, and then to end, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, um, Austria or the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because Otto Wagner worked both during the empire and after the empire collapsed.
interesting that you know the the the, the neo gothic found such a such a home in great britain in the 19th century maybe it all started with pugin augustus augustus pugin who died mad at 40 40 but until 40 he built 40 churches not to speak about other buildings and not to speak about uh, um, countless uh, publications and designs for neo-gothic furniture and so on. He was obsessed by the gothic and the neo-gothic. But he was not the only, uh, only one. As you can see here also, Sir Gilbert Scott uh, was a very animated uh, uh, working within the field of neo-gothic. Okay. So let's wish him happy birthday. He was born today, uh, the 13th of July. And now we go to this, uh, one of my preferred architects uh, of uh, Austria, and uh, not just of Austria, I think uh, Otto Wagner is indeed uh, an architect, was an architect that one cannot ignore, uh, uh, especially if you consider his, uh, his uh, steps towards the modernity uh, he was not born in. Uh, a very interesting architect, Otto Wagner. Also a great teacher. His, uh, his students uh, were uh, those who built uh, Red Vienna, that communistic Vienna within the Imperial Vienna. It was an incredible achievement in my opinion. And his students did a lot of those works, but we'll arrive there. So Otto Wagner, 1841, 1918. He um, um, he died in 1918 uh, at uh, what was his age? 59, so 77. <clears throat> so Otto Koloman Wagner. There is another Koloman, Koloman Moser, a very important uh, artist who collaborated. Was part of the secessionist movement. So Otto Koloman Wagner, but he's known mainly as Otto Wagner. Uh, was an Austrian architect, furniture designer, and urban planner. He was a leading member of the Vienna Secession movement of architecture founded in 1897 and the broader uh, Art Nouveau movement. Many of his works are found in his native city of Vienna and illustrate the rapid evolution of architecture during the period. His early works were inspired by classical architecture by mid 1890s, he had already designed several buildings in what became known as the Vienna Secession style. Beginning in 1898 with his designs of Vienna metro stations, and they can be seen now in Vienna all over the place, his style became floral and Art Nouveau with decoration by, you see, Coloman Moser. His later works, 1906 until his death in 1918, had geometric forms and minimal ornament clearly expressing their function. They are considered predecessors to modern architecture. This was the man, uh, a man obviously aware of his uh, creative powers and his uh, status within society, the Viennese society. I saw a picture, I don't know if I have it in this presentation with his office, only man only man and, and, the, and the landscape, the, the human landscape, so to speak, changed so much. I mean, in the present, there are more female students and probably uh, it's very possible that uh, soon we'll have more uh, women uh, architects than men. But at the time when he will run an office in Vienna, there were only men in his office, no woman. But he was a good architect and a good professor. And uh, looking at this profile, I think a man of spirit, uh, wisdom and intelligence. I like Otto Wagner. Some drawings, he drew a lot and uh, um, uh, he has uh, unbelievable studies, urban studies. Um, his drawings are very meticulous and very, uh, very uh, illustrative of the buildings they depict. You are going to see this building. Um, okay. 
you know, there are now even such architectural coloring books based on his drawings. Otto Wagner. Vienna is an incredible, uh, an incredible city, as you know. It's a city which, which exactly because of its dualities, that on one hand, it, it was the capital of the last empire in Europe, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and on the other hand, a very forward-looking and modern city. And you have both somehow within the city, even in the present. You are going to see this, uh, this uh, church uh, he built. This is, is a beautiful building, which unfortunately, when I visited it, I couldn't enter because it was closed. But um, I was at least in its porch. Anyway, these are drawings by, uh, well, the office of, of Otto Wagner. I, I have a hard time to imagine that, that he drew with his own hands everything that we look at here. But he, the earliest work I found uh, by him is from 1873, a uh, synagogue in Budapest, a great building. I and mean, look at this. You know, even he, I think he, it was during, uh, you know, some kind of a renovation, but, but still, and this is a very early work. It's, in, it's the first work actually that, that is probably uh, to be found by Otto Wagner and it's in Budapest and it's a synagogue, but it's, I think it's splendid. Again, who tells me that ornament should be banished from architecture? I would uh, immediately confront even with this picture, you know, I mean, can you remove the ornament from here? If you remove it, you, you impoverish the building. Yes, you have structure, but you also have ornament, you have both. If he would have built just this building, then he would have deserved to be in the history of architecture. But of course, he built many others. This is just his first work. Not bad. So this is in Budapest, Otto Wagner. Now, uh, an apartment building in Vienna, he built several, and you are going to see several of them, 1877. Uh, even here, again, you know, what do you do? What do you get if you remove the ornament? If you remove the tectonics, the tactility of, of what he created here, the skin of the building has a certain complexity. It's not just a so-called clean white wall. No. And this skin has importance as it is. It's almost three-dimensional. Well, his later works is true. They become more and more simplified and that's why he announced modernity. But uh, his earlier work 
has the richness of uh, of the the second half of the of the 19th century we can compare now we saw some works by uh, sir gilbert um, uh, scott and we see the works now of otto wagner uh, built approximately around the same time except that this one is in vienna and uh, what we saw was uh, done in, uh, in in great britain i mean <clears throat> of course nobody would do this kind of um, handrail or balustrade or uh, parapet any longer although because of the fluidities uh, afforded by parametric design uh, it might be possible and some might even do it maybe not so uh, maybe more neurotically uh, but uh, in spirit perhaps not too very different another sorry for the french here another uh, i found on the on the on the french wikipedia many more references to his works than on the the english one that's why you see here the wording in french so this is an, another apartment building in vienna already more so called modern uh, more white and uh, and uh, the decoration is uh, decreasing some golden touches what can we do it was still an empire vienna at the time i mean the capital of empire of an empire the last european empire another apartment building 1882 he built many actually and he also built a lot of, of the metro stations the subway stations which can be seen everywhere in vienna Vienna, the most uh, habitable uh, city in, in, in the world, two, two years in a row, a remarkable achievement and a remarkable city. So these are the white urban blocks of flats of Otto Wagner in Vienna. Now this is a bank uh, also in Vienna, 1884, it's, if you didn't know it was a bank, uh, it could have looked like an apartment building, although these big windows do show that there's something institutional here. And uh, sorry for the resolution here, of course, this, uh, this, uh, this round space within the building also shows um, something so-called institutional. Not to speak about this space, of course. Now, we are going to see his first house. He built for himself and his family two houses. This is the first one from 1886. And uh, you can tell this is a different sensitivity from a typical 20th century house. It was a house built within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It, it has some, maybe some influences. You know, I could think of Schinkel maybe a little bit. And uh, there is a certain romanticism, a certain fin de siècle romanticism here. Uh, with, it was without doubt a, a, a very pleasant building. Uh, and uh, although it is said that the shoemaker cannot make shoes for himself, here we see the architect being quite able to build for himself. So this is the first Otto Wagner villa, the Wagner building built for himself. And this is a rendering which is uh, clearly 
you know, done, was, was done in the 19th century. Uh, please remember these, uh, these uh, try to memorize visually these images because when we arrive at the second building that he built for himself, you realize the difference between this one and, and the other one. Well, the other one, apparently he built it for his wife, uh, thinking that his wife would uh, live longer than him, but actually she died before him. And he, he lived not in that house, but he lived in an apartment building, one of his latest uh, works, and we are going to see it, where he also had his office. So Otto Wagner, his uh, first villa for himself and his family. Another apartment building more and more white, more and more cubical, more and more modern. Uh, he was uh, in, in touch with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with his time and, and he didn't want to be left behind. So he, even his association with the secessionist movement, he didn't actually found it. He, he chose to participate in the secessionist movement a little bit later, but that was because he didn't want to, to be left behind he was a man who wanted to belong to his time in the front line. So he foresaw the, the coming of modernity. Maybe he foresaw Adolf Loss. Uh, he foresaw the decline of the ornament and he adapted himself to the realities of what was coming. But there are still, of course, uh, touches of uh, the Ancien Regime but all in all, there is a, a, an obvious so-called modernity to the building. It's cubistic, it's white, and with a strong geometry. Immeuble, uh, another uh, building, another apartment building, this one a little bit in a more confusing hybrid uh, environment is this building here. He was the quintessential architect in Vienna. Now, this is a, a, a you know a, a technical work, so to speak, but still very interesting. Eighteen ninety four. It's 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 a bridge, uh, and. Uh, you know, I wonder why we don't do bridges like this with lions here and, you know, stonework and steelwork. It, it has richness. I like it. And uh, I like it exactly because it is more than just a technocratic piece of work. And whatever the cynic uh, might say, these lions are great. You know, I imagine if you drive here and you, you have a, take a glimpse at, at, at this alliance, you get uplifted somehow. They are defenders, the, 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 the gatekeepers in a way. And look at this great metallic work. And again, you know, this is this is technology, but it's more than technology, because of also at that time, you know, even the engineer didn't uh, uh, was was this conjunction between the techne and uh, a certain kind of humanism, if I if I can call it so, which humanizes the 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 work, even the most technical kind of work. I mean, look at these details. They didn't have to be this way in terms of function, but aesthetics couldn't be removed from the most 
technical work. Essentially, these are ornaments. That's what they are. But they are important. Look at this. They give character to the work. It's not a blunt work. It's a work which has a certain amount of uh, sensitivity. I mean, look at the lion here. And the struggle for existence, which is, which belongs to all of us. You know, uh, these faces seem to say, don't worry, you are not alone. Life is tough for all of us. Move on, keep on, keep on uh, going, so to speak. I remember the words of uh, Samuel Beckett, I can go on, I will go on. Now, uh, this is a house for uh, Gustav Mahler, the great uh, composer. Uh, it's this one. Uh, I guess Gustav Mahler was doing well uh, in a city that knew something about music. Gustav Mahler had a great wife, Alma Mahler, who was uh, able to, to break many hearts of some very important men like Oskar Kokoschka or even Walter Gropius. I think she was even married to, 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 to Gropius for a short while and also she was either married or involved as a lover with Oskar Kokoschka and there was another one. This, this woman break was unbelievable, Alma Mahler. But at first I think she was the wife of, of Gustav Mahler. She probably broke the heart of Gustav uh, Mahler as well when she left him. Anyway, this is the building by Otto Wagner for Gustav Mahler. In the city of Waltzes, as Vienna was called. I love Vienna. I went to Vienna three years in a row with 300 students from Romania. I would have gone this year too or last year, but because of the pandemic, it was not possible. Nothing can be more pleasant than to ride a bike in Vienna. And the bicyclists are very respected in Vienna. Uh, you don't risk your life like in other cities. Okay, so le système ferroviaire, meaning the, the, the subway system in Vienna, where he did many stations from 1894 to 1902. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, and uh, you can see them everywhere, of course, because they are, they are uh, you know, uh, subway stations. Most of them are done by Otto Wagner and his uh, collaborators. This one in Karlsplatz is a famous one uh, because you know of its more central position, and you see the ornamentation uh, underlines the, the you know the exceptionalism of, the, of this particular station. Who said that the subway station should be banal? Why? Why should it be banal? It is not banal here, as you can see. And again and again, although he was began, be, became kind of a, you know, a contributor, if not one of the fathers of, of modernism in Austria, he was still indulging in the beauty of uh, handling uh, ornaments. Ornaments have to do with contemplation. You allow the hand to, to, to contemplate in a way to, to, to Yes, and, and, and that mental disposition we, we, we are estranged from we, because we are functionalists. We don't allow ourselves to dream with a pencil in our hand or with a mouse with a, if we were digital. We don't dream. And this is shown in our architecture. We are not dreamers. And I think it's a great loss. Now, you see the subway station which he built for the emperor himself 
uh, and so the construction of the Stadtbahn, a metropolitan railway for Vienna was the biggest infrastructure engineering project in the city around 1900. Otto Wagner, the pioneering modern architect of his day, was commissioned to design the new metro lines and station buildings, which remain a striking feature of Vienna's cityscape to this day. It was on Wagner's initiative that a pavilion was specially built for Emperor Franz Joseph and his innermost circle of family and courtier at Hitzing uh, Station, which is right almost across the, the street from, uh, from uh, Schönbrunn. Designed in unique modern style and completed, you know, it makes me smile. You'll see that the so-called modern style is not really modern at all. Anyway, designed in unique modern style and completed with opulent Art Nouveau interior decoration in 1899, the building was to serve all the needs of the emperor and his entourage. The, that Franz Joseph actually used the pavilion only twice for a trip on the Stadtbahn was of secondary importance to Otto Wagner. His main concern was that the imperial splendor, which the Supreme Court cast over the little building, should bring a breakthrough for modern architecture. After extensive renovation and restoration works, the court pavilion at Hitzing Station has now been reopened to visitors. It is a potent embodiment of Otto Wagner's artistic vision, which was to inspire the development of 20th century architecture. Here it is. Now, you tell me if this is modern. Well, if it is, it is in a very, uh, you know, uh, in a large sense, but um, it's a great building, it is true. And here on the left, it's the famous Schönbrunn. And uh, if you bike through here, I mean, my God, I become nostalgic now because I went many times with the students with bikes or without bikes. And there are very interesting things going on here, not just Schönbrunn, but also there is the Verbum colony in Vienna with a little social housing done by great architects from Adolf Loss to Gary Riedveld to uh, Hans Hartung and others. Anyway, look at this building, you know, it's considered a modern building, but uh, seen from today is not. Yet, yet, I think if this building was done almost exactly as it is, uh, it would have been published even today on Arch Daily and Desin and so on. Well, maybe it's a little bit too, too ornate, but uh, all in all, it's, it's, it's a fine building. And it's too bad that Franz Joseph, the emperor, only used it twice. But the building remains and it can be visited, even if you are not an emperor, and that's fine. Now, it's very possible Adolf Loss would have been uh, sarcastic towards this employment of ornament, but I still think the ornament uh, employed by uh, Otto Wagner has the power to convince of its uh, necessity and its beauty. Vienna is an interesting city because, yes, it has its, its imperial uh, uh, past, which is uh, important and even glorious, but also it has an avant-garde, which is uh, uh, remarkable and not just in architecture. And this is great. In the same city, you have action and reaction. You have, you know, uh, imperial and imperial, uh, you know, presence, which even today is felt. And then you have very non-conformist artists and architects in that very city. I mean, the secession movement itself, and I will end this presentation with a, with a call to arms, so to speak, of the secessionists, the building by Maria Olbrich. A great city in Vienna.
now these floral designs we can uh, bring to three dimensions at least three dimensions through parametries uh, parametric design and through scripting and programming there is a fluidity that that is very affordable so to speak today in architecture thanks to the latest uh, technologies and and there is a reaction against uh, a strict uh, Cartesian spirit. Uh, so the so-called fluid, uh, I mean, Zaha Hadid, who taught in Vienna for 20 years at the Institute of Architecture, she published two books. I mean, her studio was, was well, two, published, two books were published, uh, Total Fluidity and, uh, and uh, Fluid Totality, two books. And in those two books, this message is for the Romanians here, there are six or seven Romanian students in Vienna who studied with Zaha Hadid, and they are in the in the book. And I have that book, and I can show it to anyone who wants to see it. <clears throat> there was a student who finished uh, her studies in Bucharest, and then she enrolled in the Zaha Hadid program at the IOA. And she told me, Ioana Binica, she told me that when she went to school. She thought she was in Romania because out of 30 students, seven of them were Romanians and they talked Romanian between each other. Back to Otto Wagner and his, uh, <laughs> I don't know who designed the carpet. I don't think he designed it himself, but uh, it's a little bit uh, whitish or anyway light for my for my taste especially when you consider the walls being dark uh, but uh, and then but i guess being the the station of uh, uh, the emperor franz joseph uh, there were people to clean it up plus it's very possible that the soles of the shoes uh, or the boots of the great emperor were uh, themselves so clean that, that that the carpet didn't suffer. Okay, so this is the subway station of the Emperor Franz Joseph by Otto Wagner across the street from Schönbrunn. He didn't design the Schönbrunn though. That was designed by uh, another great, uh, uh, great Austrian architect. Kausan built three buildings also in Romania, uh, a church uh, or a cathedral in Timisoara. Fischer von Erlach was the architect and his son also worked for the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna. They both did. Okay, so La Maison de, now this is a very important uh, apartment building in, uh, in Vienna. Across the street from this building, there is a great uh, flea market, which I enjoyed going to uh, with a bicycle and to discover little things, very inexpensive, but very, uh, very interesting. Anyway, so again, he was one of the fathers of modernism in Austria. Well, look at this ornamentation. Where are those people who throw stones at those who claim that the ornament uh, is, uh, has its value? Otto Wagner thought so too, and in, a, in a, an abundant way, did he not? I mean, you know, look at this. If you do something like this today, you'd be considered out of your mind. But um, at that time, uh, he, he, he was able to do it. And indeed, if you remove the ornament, what do you get? You get, a, you get an impoverishment of the building. That's what you get. The building is richer like this. He designed actually two buildings here. It's this one and the next one. Uh, I hope you'll see both in this presentation. So both this one and this one were done by Otto Wagner.
it's kind of funny. We are the country of Voronez, which has, you know, exterior uh, uh, painting, but but we are very reluctant to accept something like this in the architecture of the present. Why? Why is it Voronez? a positive example of a creativity which didn't say no to color and ornament and uh, even to a narrative uh, form of ornamentation because of course it's the biblical story there and we don't we, we we don't even think of the possibility of using ornament on our white walls as if Voronets is not part of our culture. Uh, this is the building next door, so to speak, is this one in the corner. So the one we just saw is this one on the left. Sorry for the resolution of the building of the picture. And uh, he also designed this one. You see it here. Now these golden medallions, look what is going on here. And again, if we remove these things, what do we get? Do we get a, a better building? I don't think so. As the building advances towards its top, it becomes more and more lyrical, so to speak, and more and more plastically interesting. And it makes sense. It is, in a way, approaching the coiffure of the building, even if it has a flat roof. Because it is the transition between the earth and the sky. The more the building advances towards the sky, the more it becomes, uh, I said, lyrically, maybe uh, lyrical. I don't know if the word was uh, the most appropriate, but you understand the building moving upwards towards the sky, it, 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 it seems to uh, feel a need to honor that, that, that uh, movement towards uh, the above through becoming uh, plastically, uh, artistically more uh, engaged, so to speak, and richer. Something we don't think any longer of. Most of the time, we don't reflect on the relationship between the earth and the sky. Now, I want to show you through contrast, a project done by a Spanish architect who is young, uh, who I, whom I know personally. He did, a, I, I launched a few years ago, a competition tattooing Vienna, and he chose to disfigure one of the two buildings by, uh, in fact, the building we just saw by uh, Otto Wagner in a violently uh, excessive uh, project uh, which employs an exasperated form of fluidity. And you are going to see the name of the architect is Gonzalo Vallo, and he's Spanish, and he, he teaches and works in, uh, in Vienna. Look what he did. So the building that we just saw is now destroyed by this uh, neurotical intervention of Gonzalo Vallo. Uh, it's the, it's the, 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 the how to say, the, uh, the reaction of the son against the father. is the conflict between the father and the son. I'm sure he admires Otto Wagner, 
But sometimes the relationship between the father and the son, of course, I'm talking metaphorically, you know, but it, 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 it's about moving forward. It's about the relationship with tradition. And yes, this is an exasperated uh, expression of that tension, but uh, I guess he, he, he wanted to react against, uh, uh, you know, uh, the sweetness of uh, excessive nostalgia or uh, idolization, um, uh, feti the fetishization of, uh, of the father figure of Otto Wagner. Uh, look at the plans. He's a master of working with Maya, and he taught also at the Institute of Architecture in the excessive program. He was the assistant of, uh, her, uh, of uh, Diaz Alonso, um, who, who is now the director of SIA in Los Angeles. So in my uh, launching that competition, I, 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 I talked about the need for tattooing Vienna in the very city where Adolf Loss thought that uh, tattooing is a degenerate uh, practice and the more civilized a city, the less uh, tattoos, but it is not true. In Vienna, I saw many uh, tattoo shops and people still tattoo themselves and that's not because they are primitive, is because certain uh, traits of the human uh, spirit uh, um, are, are uh, maybe eternal. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I, I also thought that tattooing uh, a building was necessary in order to externalize uh, hidden parts of our psyche. Because many buildings in Vienna, despite the fact that it is a great city, are actually quite placid and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a way, life, lifeless, banal. So look what uh, Gonzalo Vallo did. <laughs> I, I wonder what Otto Wagner would have thought of this. This is planned chaos. That's what it is. designed or drawn or modeled with Maya. Turbulence, that's what it is. It is a turbulence. But here we see the, or, the, the, the revenge in a way, the coming back of the ornament in three dimensions. So, you know, in a certain paradoxical way, while it destroys the building by Otto Wagner, it also continues in a way its legacy in the form of what art or the art of building is or could be today. Now, uh, this is a very important work by uh, Otto Wagner, is uh, the postal office. It's a huge building. In fact, across the street from this building, a little bit to the left, is that famous uh, uh, penthouse uh, or rooftop addition by Kopp Himmelblau, the first, they claim, the first deconstructivist building ever built. Uh, this building in the center is by Otto Wagner. And it is a remarkable building, and not just because of the sculptures which adorn its, uh, its top. Uh, this interior is present in uh, most uh, histories of modern architecture. It's a glorious, uh, really, um, uh, public space within this, um, it used to be a postal office. It's very well designed. And this is indeed modern, although it is a modernity which has a certain age now, but it is modern. And it is sublime. It, it, it is uh, really one of his best works. Otto Wagner. Bot, uh, Postal office. Now, when we think of post offices, we don't we don't have such grandiose visions of of, of, of them. But uh, 
uh, at that time, uh, you know, uh, obviously they had uh, different thoughts about what a post office should be or could be. A huge building, is it not? <laughs> You wonder, you know, it's like, I mean, it's like a palace. Otto Wagner. Now, because I mentioned right across the street from that postal office is this famous little work, uh, the beginning of the career of Kopp Himmelblau, the penthouse, the rooftop addition. It's a rooftop remodeling, as it was called. It started with this sketch, and uh, you probably know it. It, it. it was considered by them and by other people as the first deconstructivist work together with a remodeling of the kitchen of the private house of Frank Gehry. So they build this thing on top of a, an existing building. It's not easy to see from the street because this one has seven, eight floors. But, but uh, you know, thanks to the photographs, we can see it at the level of the eye. This is the plan. What, why am I showing these works? Because times evolved with all due respect for Otto Wagner and for uh, history, we have to represent our time. And our time is different from 100 years ago. So, as such, we have to respect the, and express the truth of our time. And uh, Kopp Himmelblau, uh, Wolf Prix, uh, they, they, uh, they, they certainly knew what Vienna was. They lived and worked in Vienna, they still do but they felt like protesting. It was a form of protesting, maybe against the grandmother. Uh, this is the interior of this uh, rooftop addition. Now, of course, the, the, the conference table is not really a deconstructivist work, nor the chairs, but uh, the architecture is engaging. Now, we arrive at this beautiful work by uh, Otto Wagner from 1903, 1907, Leglise, uh, the church, St. Leopold, I mean, uh, it's called the Steinhof Church, which is part of a, a, a campus with a, a, a hospital for uh, mental uh, uh, patients with mental problems. It's a great church and it has great uh, uh, stained glass windows by Coloman Moser. So very different now from the works we saw by uh, both uh, uh, Parler and, uh, and uh, Sir Gilbert Scott. It's a little bit hard to arrive here, especially if you are tired and you don't have strong legs because this is on top of a steep uh, hill. But uh, uh, once you arrive there, it's very rewarding. It's a white cube, yes, but because of the golden dome and the, the, you know, the ornaments and so on, it's, it's rich, it's engaging, it's interesting. It's not a very big building, but it's a very original building. and. Uh, you can only admire its, uh, its uh, comple com complexity and simplicity.
also although at Chartreux Cathedral in France there are no there is no gold like this this is much more ornamental and sumptuous but somehow the expression of this angel makes me think of the of the famous angels of uh, of, uh, of Chartreux because there is a, a piety here that that uh, seems to be genuinely felt and expressed now this is a, a, a building uh, I didn't see it when I, I and I went several times to Vienna. Uh, it's it's a building which without glory in a way because it was left uh, kind of uh, I don't know uh, not renovated or uh, I don't know it, very well its function. It's a restore on now there. Uh, uh, anyway, it is by Otto Wagner. Now we arrive at his second uh, house. Uh, his second villa, second Wagner villa from 1912, and you can tell the difference if you remember his first house he built for himself. I understood he built this for his wife, thinking that she will live longer than him, but uh, fate decided that he lived longer than her. She died before him, and he chose to live in an apartment building which he built, and we are going to see it. But we already see. Uh, the passage of time and the fact that Otto Wagner became more and more so-called uh, modern, although there are touches here of uh, what he used to do, but uh, in a more, uh, uh, you know, restrained way. The drawing hmm, maybe is not so different from uh, what we saw there, but still the architecture is much more simplified. So he was evolving. He was not stuck into his, uh, you know, way of doing things. No, he, he he was evolving himself, for the better or the worse. But he was evolving. He was open. We don't use such things any longer, you know, at the entrances of our buildings, you know, what, what is here, we don't know, but uh, whatever it is, I think it is a, uh, you know, it is a lesson in architecture and, uh, and uh, we have to welcome it. He couldn't give up on, on ornament uh, easily, obviously. We are not immersed any longer in mythology. What, what could this mean, you know, is the conquering of the beast? I, 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 I don't know, but uh, it probably has a meaning. It's too bad our architecture is not narrative any longer. We don't narrate anything with our buildings. And it's sad. It's a great loss, I would say. This is the, the first villa, Wagner villa, and this is the new one. So now I show, I think I end the, the presentation of the two apartment buildings that he built uh, were erected on two ideas and parcels. They clearly show Otto Wagner's interpretation of the urban apartment building. In their simplicity, <clears throat> the buildings reflect socioeconomic conditions in the Doberglasse, <clears throat> Doberglasse building was the last city apartment of Otto Wagner. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> and he lived from 1911 to 1918 there, <clears throat> as well as his last studio. The building housed the Otto Wagner archive from 1985 to 2003. So this is the other building. There are two buildings next to each other very very modern in a way um, very few touches of uh, ornamental disposition but otherwise <clears throat> a cubicle and, and simple and even austere with the exception of the you know, first two floors But there is uh, elegance even within austerity.
and, th and this is the building where he spent his last years of his life and where his studio was and where the archive Otto Wagner was. I guess the archive moved. But again, look at the building where he chose to live his last years of his life. The man who grew up within the empire, no? The, and he honored uh, Franz Joseph. We saw him with that uh, sumptuous subway station and he chose to live in this building his last years. You, if you didn't know it was built by Otto Wagner, you could have passed by this building without even stopping. So he lived here for six years from 1912 to 1918. We see here in the word Baukünstler, the word Kunst, Kunst, art. Let us not forget this. Architecture is an art. And those who think it is not are wrong. Because if it, was an art, if it wasn't an art, architecture would not be present in the majority, if not all of the histories of art. Now, the, v the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art, interesting academy, uh, with an interesting name, is within this building. It's here, that, that the door, the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. Maybe all art, if it's good, has to be, to an extent at least, visionary. But this is how he designed in his early years, and this is how he designed later. Obviously, the years passed. And I will end this presentation on Otto Wagner with this, um, uh, in a way, call to arms by uh, uh, Maria Olbrich, who designed the secessionist building, a famous building in Vienna. And if you see here uh, these two lines, uh, uh, let's read them. Der Zeit ihre Kunst, Kunst, der Kunst ihre Freiheit. Sorry for my German is not great, but I have the translation here. And with this, I end this presentation. To every age, it's art. <clears throat> to art, it's freedom. We should not forget this. We cannot build today as someone would have built 60 years ago or even 30 years ago. So to our age, our art, and to art, it's freedom is very, very, very important that to every age, it's art and to art is freedom. Happy birthday, uh, Otto Wagner. Thank you.